God's word to you about Solomon's temple, the temple uh, that was built in the Old Testament. We know that, hopefully we know that story well. Um, in 1 Kings 6, chapter, uh, 1 Kings 6, verses 12 through 13, we see that God had vowed to fulfill his promise to King David. So we spent some time in weeks past talking about King David, talking about how God worked in his life, how King David was a, a man after God's own heart. And God made these incredible promises to David. And David, in his later part of his life, all he really wanted to do was build a place for the Lord to dwell. Right? That was in his heart. And, and, and God said, no, David, I won't do that with you. I'll do that with your son. You've been a, a mighty warrior king for my for my sake, but you shed a lot of blood. Um, I need a time of peace. So I'm going to fulfill this promise with your son, in your son. And, and as I thought about that, right, as we, as we live our lives and we know the promises God makes to us sometimes, sometimes we ask of things. And I thought about that for a bit. Maybe God is going to fulfill things for us in our lives through, through our, our kids, our, the next generation, right? And, and, and so sometimes when we, when we beseech God and we ask him for things even for him, the answer may be, well, it's yes, but for your son or for your daughter or, or whomever else. I mean, again, God is God works in incredible ways, ways we don't think of. And I think about this conversation Dave, David had in his heart for the Lord. The Lord said, no, not yet but I will fulfill this promise to your son, um, Solomon. And so we see Solomon, if you know the story, King David, he reigned. King David had a lot of kids. We didn't have as many kids as King David, um, but he had a lot of kids. And God blessed Solomon to, to be the one who, who was going to give all the promises that he promised to David uh, up to that point and beyond through his son, Solomon. So Solomon had 40 years, and I just want to set the stage for you a little bit. Solomon had 40 years as the king of Israel, where he reigned in peace and prosperity. Uh, Solomon, as you know, was probably one of the most, was the wisest man at, that was ever known in the world at that time, right? He was the wisest man. He was the wealthiest man. There was none like him, and that was how big and how how. Uh, gracious God's blessing was on King David through his son Solomon. And King Solomon had all the blessings that God had in store for him. So he had 40 years of peace, which meant he had 40 years of building, right? Fulfilling the rest of the promises God had for David, right? So we're going to be talking about promises today, right? And so he had 40 years of building. So we see King Solomon uh, building a palace. We see King Solomon building cities. We see him, him building the Navy, a Navy. We see him building the greatest army that that area had ever seen up to that point. These are all from the blessings of peace that God had blessed King Solomon to do. And yet we see the greatest thing that he had done with his hands, with his imagination was the building of the temple. The building of the temple. Solomon's ultimate achievement was building a place that David had in his heart for the Lord to come, for the Lord to come and be with his people. So we know when we read, when we, and hopefully you've gotten this theme by now, as we read the Old Testament, as we go through the Old Covenant and we see uh, these stories that we've heard over and over and over again, I hope what's been happening for you uh, like for me, you know, we grew up in the church. We remember the old Bible story books, those blue books. Remember that was illustrated by, uh, what's his name, Basil Wolvington. You guys, I see, I see some people in the back smiling, right? But these, these are way beyond stories, right? Because now what we get a chance to see with open eyes is how even the story of the Solomon's Temple, how that pointed to Jesus Christ, who is the true temple. Right. And so now we can look back and we can glean all these things that God had been speaking about over and over and over again that maybe we hadn't noticed because for us, maybe it was just the Bible story. 
or maybe for us it was just the movie the Ten Commandments, or maybe for us it was just the movie Solomon's Temple, right? And so when we have the opportunity to do, I know sometimes when as we go through these Old Testament stories, sometimes it feels like a, a little bit of a history lesson. Uh, but yeah, yeah, that's what it is. It's his story. His story, capital H, capital I, capital S, his story lesson for us today, right? So we know the scripture is for our edification. So we look back on Solomon's temple and we want to say, we want to ask the question, well, what can we learn from what we read about in so about Solomon building this temple? Now, I won't go into all of the detail because there, there are chapters <laughs> in the Bible. There are have you ever read through the Bible? Have you, have you ever read through the Bible? Yes. Some of them, oh, yeah, oh, okay. And you know there are chapters that just talks about, you know, your feet and, and inches and measures and weights and how God blessed certain artisans and literally with the spirit to do certain things, right? There's chapters replete with this detail, this wondrous detail about how the temple was built. So we know that Solomon was doing something that was unheard of in his time, the, the amount of money that he spent, that he raised, the amount of labor that he used. See, you know, but earlier on, God said, you're going to have a king He's going to tax you, right? He's going to work you, all uh, right? And King Solomon, during those 40 years of peace and building, well, he had to tax and he had to put people to work in order to do that. So even in his promises, God was saying, hey, you ask for a king, these are the things that happens. Yet God used that, right? This painstaking detail to build this temple where God's presence is going to reside. So we know the temple was to be a place where the faithful presence of God will be experienced so that the nations would know that the Lord is God. So we know from the very beginning when God pulled the children of Israel out of Egypt, he wanted them to be his people so that the Lord, so that the people, the world would know that he is God. And all the things that happened and all those stories from the Red Sea, through the manna, through the pillar of fire, through the cloud at night, through vast armies being vanquished by the true Lord who is God. And God called his chosen ones to show the rest of the world that he is Lord and he is God, not just for the sake of the children of Israel, but for the whole world to know that the Lord is God. And so we have this temple that is built that will remind not only the children of Israel, but the nations around Israel at that time, not only to remind those of the Old Testament, to remind us, all of us in here today, that the Lord is God. And so as we go through and journey through this story briefly today, we understand that that's what he wanted the nations to know, that he was the Lord and he was God. Jesus spoke of himself then as we look forward. Jesus spoke of himself as God's temple. And in his life and in his death and in his resurrection, he was faithful to God's name. He embodied God's presence and he extended God's mission, right? So we see the old pointing to the new, but the old says the same thing. Now, when we look at the new, now it's at a whole different level. We're not talking about a, a simple building with intricate details. Now we're talking about the human heart. Now we're talking about the finished work of Jesus and what that means for us, those of us who are sitting in here today. What is his finished work mean for us as Paul calls us in 1 Corinthians the temple of God's Holy Spirit what does that mean for us today so again we're not just looking at the story just for the sake of the story we're looking for his story right as it points to us today and so what does his story then mean for me and you so in today's message we'll look at what the temple embodied in the days of the children of Israel in the Old Testament and what that means for us Christians today 
as we are called the temple of the Holy Spirit in the wake of who Jesus is and what he accomplished in the New Testament. You got that? <laughs> That's the little trip we're going to take this morning in about 30, 40 minutes, something like that, right? So it's, it's good. So we want to look at Solomon's temple first, and we're going to glean some points there, but we're going to also see that those points that we're going to go over real quick is the same thing, the temple in the Old Testament, the temple in the New Testament, in Christ, what does it mean? So the first thing I want to point out for Solomon's temple is the temple was to host God's presence. So if you have your Bibles, hopefully you do, or your device, as Melvin said, let's turn to 1 Kings uh, chapter 8. 1 Kings chapter 8, verses 10 through 14, we'll read. 1 Kings chapter 8. Sorry, guys, I ran out of time. I didn't put the scripture on there, please, for you, but hopefully old-fashioned write-down notes and all that good stuff. So for chapter, uh, chapter 8, verse 10, it says, when the priest came out of the holy place, so now we have the temple's been built, and now we're going to have a dedication of the temple. And we see something here. When the priest came out of the holy place, the cloud filled with the Lord's temple. It became, and because of the cloud, now we know the cloud was God's glory now. Now the cloud descends upon in the middle of Israel into the temple, God's presence shows up. And because of God's presence, because of his glory, the priests were not able to continue ministering for the glory of the Lord filled the temple. Verse 12, then Solomon said, the Lord said that he would dwell in total darkness. I have indeed built an, an exalted temple for you, Lord, a place for your dwelling forever. The king turned around and blessed the entire congregation of Israel while they were standing. So if, you're, if your imagination can see it, um, I don't know. I had a picture of the temple. I don't know if you guys have that. I'm, I'm kind of wondering if you have it up there. Um, but if you can imagine the children of Israel being around this temple and the ministers are in there and all of a sudden God's glory overwhelms and then he comes into the middle of darkness as the scripture calls it. In the middle of his people to dwell there. So the temple was to be a place that God's presence was to be. God was present to dwell among his people. And that was different because no other God, it was all these false gods that the children of Israel ran into, all these nations that worshiped all these gods. Those gods never dwelt with their people. Those, those gods were put on pedestals and they were uh, images of animals and creatures and things of that nature. But their God was something to be feared, something to be looked at, not to dwell with. They had temples too, but little temples that they kept those idols in. But this, with us, with this God, our God, Father, Son, and Spirit, this was different. God came to dwell among his people. If you recall at the Mount Sinai, when God first made his presence known, the children of said, no, uh, Moses, you go up. Right? So because of their thoughts and Eventually, their sin. They were afraid of God. They said, "No, Moses, you go." And so Moses went up to, into Mount Sinai and he communed with God. But now it's different. Moses is not here anymore. Now God's saying, "I'm coming into your presence, and I'm going to be in the presence with you." And and in His presence, being there, He was inviting them to be with Him. His presence with us. His presence with them. And we begin to see here that this is a theological term, and we'll, we'll go through it, but we we'll start to see that God is imminent, I-M-M-A-N-E-N-T. God is imminent. Now we have a God who's relating to us, right? Imminence. When we say that, we say God is personal, and God is relatable to those made in his image while remaining completely distinct and unique from all of his creations. God is not a distant deity. So when we look at this story, we see God is coming. God is not, he's not out there somewhere in space. God is coming in. He's coming in, right? He's moving towards us. He's not requiring us to move towards him. 
or to move up to where he is, this God is coming down with his people, right? And for the first time, we start to see God is going to relate to his people, his creation in a different way. And so we see the temple represents God's presence being among the people. The next point I'll, I'll, I'll share with you here, the temple declares God's faithfulness. So we know that God's presence is here. Now this finished temple represents God's faithfulness to his people and to King David in particular. Let's turn to 1 Kings and we'll go to verse 20 and we'll read verses 20 and 21. 1 Kings 8, 20 and 21. The Lord has fulfilled what he promised. This is if you read that, that, that chapter, this is Solomon talking to the people at the dedication. I have taken the place of my father, David, and I sit on the throne of Israel as the Lord promised. I have built the temple for the, for the, same, for the name of the Lord, the God of Israel. I have provided a place there for the ark where the Lord's covenant is that he made with our ancestors when he brought them out of the land of Egypt. So this was almost like the culminating, the culmination of all the promises God had made to David and to, and to uh, the children of Israel through David, right? If you look at 2 Samuel 7, verses 8 through 16, we see the promise, and I'll read that scripture to you. You can turn with me if you will and read that, but we'll see the God's promise to David. And now all of a sudden, if you can imagine when you, if you were there and you go to worship, you can think about these things. Everybody knows who King David is. Everybody knows the lore. Everybody knows what God did through King David. But think about the relational things you can think of when you're walking to a worship in this temple. 2 Samuel 7, verse 8. Now then, and listen to the promises. Listen to the promises. I want you to listen to these promises. And then I want you to think about it as we read these promises. Lord, what have you promised me? What do you promise me, Lord? Right? What can I have in you, Lord? Right? Because you're the same Lord yesterday, today, and tomorrow and forever. So if you're the same Lord and you promise these things to your chosen one, David, and your, your people, Lord, what did you promise me? Second Samuel verse 8. Now then, this is um, Nathan uh, is being spoken to here by God. Now then, tell my servant David. This is what the Lord Almighty says. I took you from the pasture, from tending the flock, and appointed you ruler over all of my people of Israel. So we see that God ordained a future for David when he was in the pasture. He ordained a future for him. Verse 9, I have been with you wherever you have gone. God provided godly companionship for David wherever he went. And I have cut off all your enemies from before you. God has given him godly protection. These are the promises God gave. This is what God gave to David. Now I will make your name great like the names of the greatest men on earth. God gave him a godly reputation. One God gave him. Not one that David earned, but one that God gave him. Verse 10, and I will provide a place for my people Israel and will plant them so that they can have a home of their own and no longer be disturbed. God provided David and the, and the children of Israel a home, a place to call home, a place to, 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 to rest their feet. Wicked people will not oppress them anymore as they did at the beginning and have done ever since the time I appointed leaders over my people of Israel. So God, again, is reassuring me, I'm giving them protection. I will also give you rest from all of your enemies. How many of you guys want rest? Come on. Come on. Uh, listen, come on now. Don't be ashamed. <laughs> Don't be ashamed. Come on. Now. I know everybody wants rest. I'll just say it. Everybody wants rest. These are God's promises. This is what... This is what the temple and body, right? They got they got the chance to see this and, and, and worship God in remembrance of all these things, but so do you, right? God gave them rest. The Lord declares to you that the Lord Himself 
will establish a house for you. The Lord will establish a house for you. So how much planning are we doing to establish our houses and our, our own plans, and our own thoughts, right? How, how much energy do we expend doing those types of things? But the Lord said, he will do it for you. Amen. Amen. Right? He said he'll do it for you. Right? When your days are over and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your offsprings to succeed you. Your, your own flesh and blood, and I will establish his kingdom. So, so, so what about our kids? What about, what about the next generation? Right? I know we talk about that. Where are our kids? What about the next generation? Are, are we asking those kind of questions and wondering? Right? Come on, I know we are. Those of us who have children who are out there, right? We want them to succeed. The, the, the Lord says, I have a promise for you, right? We just have to have faith in his timing and in his execution and how he does it and, and ask for his provisions to, to make it through <laughs> as we journey with them, right? Amen. But the Lord has plans for them, right? The Lord says this, guys, I read a straight out of scripture, the CSB. If you have an IV or any other, it's going to say essentially the same thing. When you're old, now I don't, it doesn't give an age, doesn't give an age when you're old. Whereas Tony, Tony and I were talking about in your old age, it doesn't say how old is old, right? It doesn't say how old is old. When you're old, this is what the Lord said he's going to do. Verse 13, he is the one who will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. So now we're talking about with King David and his people. Verse 14, it says, I will be his father, and he will be my son. So God is promising godly relationships again. I will be his father. And he will be my son. When he does wrong, like a father and a son, I will punish him <laughs> with a rod wielded by men with flogging and inflicted by human hands. And we saw that. So when we read those examples, when we read through the Old Testament, we see Israel moving further and further away. We see all these things happening. We know that God loves them. Like a father loves a son, because he says here, when they do wrong, I will punish him. I'm going to love them. But he says in verse 15, but my love would never be taken away from him. God's love would never be taken away from us. As I took it away from Saul, whom I removed before you. So he removed his favor from Saul. Your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established Forever. So there again, God is promising a godly future. So when the children of Israel had an opportunity to go to worship the Lord, who was the who was the true God, and as they rehearsed and as they thought about all the blessings, and as they went to sacrifice, all these things should should have come to their mind about the promises God gave to them through their through uh, through King David. And fulfilled in his son Solomon, right? So God, again, we're reminded that the temple declared God's faithfulness. So, not to get ahead of myself, but when we when we, do, when we, when we come into church, are we reminded of God's faithfulness? <laughs> when we wake up in the morning as the temple of the Holy Spirit, are we reminded of God's favor? Are we reminded of the promises God makes about our children? Are we reminded about the future that he has for us, that he says he has for us? Are we reminded who we are in Christ? Are we reminded that we are who he says we are? Are we reminded that we have what he says we have in him? Are we reminded we can do what he says we can do in him? Are we reminded of that, church, when we come to worship? Are we reminded? And then finally, the temple advanced God's mission. 1 Kings 8, verses 54 through 61. 
It says, when Solomon finished praying this entire prayer and petition to the Lord, he got up from kneeling before the altar of the Lord with his hands spread out towards heaven. And he stood and he blessed the whole congregation of Israel with a loud voice. And he said, blessed be the Lord. He has given rest to his people Israel according to all he has said. Now, one of all the good promises he made through his servant Moses has failed. May the Lord our God be with us as he was with our ancestors. And so as leaders in this church, hopefully we're making that same declaration as we point you to the Lord. May the Lord our God be with us like he was our ancestors. May, not, may he not abandon us or leave us, verse 58, so that he causes us to be devout to him, so that he causes us to be devout to him, to walk in all his ways and to keep his commands, his statutes, his ordinances, which he commanded our ancestors. May my words, which I have made my petition before the Lord, be near the Lord our God day and night. May it be there day and night. May he uphold his servant's cause and the cause of all his people Israel as each day requires. Verse 60. May all the peoples of the earth know that the Lord is God. There is no other. May the, all the people on the earth know that the Lord is God and there is no other. Wow. Be wholeheartedly devoted to the Lord our God to walk in his statutes and to keep his commands as it is today. This was King Solomon's prayer at the temple, at the dedication of the temple. So what about you and me then? As we, as we read, as we read that prayer of dedication, as we were reminded about what the temple represented, what about me and you today? Well, if we look at 1 Corinthians, we see Paul, if, if, if you read 1 Corinthians, if you know anything about 1 Corinthians, you know that Corinthian church has some issues. And Paul was constantly having to remind them who they were. And in 1 Corinthians 3, verses 16, in 17, he said, as he's, as he's reminding them, don't you, don't you yourselves know that you are God's temple and that the spirit of God lives in you? New Life Fellowship, don't you know that you are God's temple and that the spirit of God lives in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him for God's temple is holy. So remember I said you are who God says you are in Christ? Have you read that recently? Have you read that you're in the temple and that God says you are holy because the Holy Spirit dwells in you? Have you read about that recently, about yourself? Right? Have you read that? 1 Corinthians 6, verses 19 through 20, he says, don't you know then that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit uh, the Holy Spirit who was in you. So again, Paul was addressing a whole lot of different issues here in chapter six. They were, they were talking about foods to idols and rather what you can eat and what you can't eat. There was sexual immorality going on. And Paul said, stop! Don't you know who you are? Don't you know, church, who you are? Stop. Stop. You, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. So when you talk about eating and drinking, do it within the context of your body being the temple of the Holy Spirit. When you're, when you're contemplating sexual immorality and, and, and doing things that you're not supposed to contemplate, that you are, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, whom you have from God. The scripture says you are not your own. So that's a concept that this gets lost nowadays because we want to do our own thing. We want to do what feels good to us. We want to do our own thing. We want to decide what's right for us and what's wrong for us. Church, the scripture says you are not 
your own, for you were bought at a price. So because you were bought at a price and, you're, and, and your body is not your own, glorify God with your body. So I'm here to say to you then that what you do with your body as the temple of the Holy Spirit given to us by the Father matters. It matters where your feet go. It matters what you hear in your ears. It matters what you see. It matters what you say. If you are a believer and, and you are a Christ follower, it matters. It matters. Okay? Because God's presence is with us. So just like the temple, the first thing we need to remember as the temple uh, of the Holy Spirit is that God's presence is is in us, and it is with us. So it matters. Yes, it does matter. If no one hasn't told you that it doesn't matter what you listen to or who you're listening to or what you talk about or what you say, I'm here to say from the scripture, it does matter because your body's not your own. Right, so I'm just here to remind us of that. <laughs> That's all I'm doing, church. I I'm in here too. I have to remember the same thing. It does matter what we say. It matters, it matters how we relate with our, it does. Because again, we're talking about what our life embodies, about what Christ has done through the finished work of Jesus Christ. Now we are his temple, right? Through Jesus' shed blood. That's how we were purchased, yes? So do we, again, do we think about that, though? Are we thinking about that, right? Because if you don't think about it, if you don't pray about it, if you're not reading about it, if you're not talking about that, then you're probably going to forget that and think that my body is mine and forget that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit and that we belong to Christ, right? So it does matter. It does. It does. So I just, you know, so we as God's temple, we're reminded of that today, church. We're reminded of, as a second point here, for this particular part, our temple then declares God's faithfulness by our testimony. Right? So I, I was laughing about it when I asked about how your testimony life is, or, or what, what, your, what, your, what, your, uh, what your testimony life is about, but it does matter. It does matter. Right? Because that we, we testify and we witness of Christ, right? Because we read in the Old Testament that the, all the world should know. Even back then and even today, all the world should know. And how does Father, Son, and Holy Spirit choose to make himself known? You thought about that. You and me. That, that's how that's how it's done. So that's why it matters what you say and do, right? There's so many arguments against the church. There's so many arguments against religion because religious folk are duplicitous in, in the argument of some folks. If you talk to people, you ask them, why don't you come to church? Oh, man, you guys talk out of both sides of your mouth. Because what they see doesn't match up to what they hear, and they know it. They know it. Right, that's why it matters. That's why it matters. So that's why I ask, how's your, how's your testimony life? How, you te how is your testimony life? Uh, let's turn to Titus 3. I want to read a couple of scriptures here. And I want to show you where our tes testimony life should be coming from as temples of the Holy Spirit. Titus 3, we're going to read verses 3 through 7. And I'm reading from the ESV in this particular scripture, so it may not be perfect for you. Titus 3. It says, for we ourselves were once foolish. So now, we're, again, we're talking about our witness and our testimony of, of Christ, of the Father and of the, Holy, of the Holy Spirit. So how many of us felt at one point in our lives and, and we were foolish? How many foolish folk do we have out there today? <laughs> for we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient. How many of us? been disobedient. How many of us are disobedient? 
<laughs> okay, we got hands coming up in the eyes. I won't call names, but we all basically should be raising our hands at some point. How many of us have been led astray? Slaves to various passions and pleasures. Passing our days in malice and envy. <laughs> Hated by others and hating one another. Man, I hear we see that all the time. You know we got caught up in that sometimes. But, but when the goodness and loving kindness of God, our Savior, appeared, he saved us. He saved us from all of that I just talked about that we just read. We got saved from that. Not because of works done by us in righteousness, because our righteousness is like filthy rags. It ain't nothing. Right? So not because of anything we do, but according to his own mercy by the washing of regeneration. So he poured a little bit of regeneration on you, right? And the renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. So I wanted to read that scripture for you because that's the essence of testimony. As Ms. Veronica said, I was blind, but now I see. Have you ever read that, that uh, testimony of the blind man who was healed in, uh, in John? <laughs> who was in, in the temple? And he was like, I don't know who he is, but all I know is I was blind, but now I see. Right? And they kept on asking him. He says, why do you keep, you know, they asked his parents. And the parents were like, why are you asking him? He's a grown man. His testimony is, I, all I know is his goodness. I was once this way, but now I'm that way. I was once filled with strife, but now the Lord has given me peace in all this craziness. I was once filled with anxiety, but the Lord has given me his peace. Right? So when people ask me, what's, what, what are you smiling for? You can say, I was blind, but now I see. I was worried, now I have peace. I was feeling lonely, but I've been filled with the love of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. So I am loved. I am loved. Yeah, I know my life looks a certain way. But here is the reality, folks, and this is my witness and my testimony as the temple of the Holy Spirit. So that's why, you know, I joked about it a little bit, but it's not a joking matter. We, we say it every single week. Melvin repeated it today. What our, what our disciple-making strategy is. What is it, right? What is our disciple-making strategy? I mean, that's real. So again, it, this all fits together as his temple, right? What we do and what we say and how we say it, where we are, where we go matters, right? God wants to send us into this world so that we can testify to what he can be known. You know, Pastor T, you sent us a devotional that, that, was, that reminded me of that earlier last week, I think. But how we need to get in the lives and the streams of those around us, the people we're closest to. Are we so frustrated with the people we're closest to that we can't even talk to them and show them God's goodness? Can, can, can we show them what forgiveness looks like, even though we feel like they, they, it looks like they're hurting us over and over and over again? And we keep coming back smiling, you know, because we know the grace of God is on us, right? And no, it's not comfortable. It's, it's, not, it's not painless, but I, we got joy, right? We have joy that's unspeakable. We have peace that surpasses all understanding. So we can testify to his goodness and where that comes from, the Lord Jesus Christ. And then finally, as, as his temple, we advance Jesus' mission. Just like the mission, there was a mission in the Old Testament, there's a mission today. And his mission is to be known. And, and how does he execute it? He asks us to come with him, right? He asks us to come with him. Verse 60 said, 
1 Kings 8, verse 60, I'll remind you, may all the peoples of the earth know that the Lord is God. There is no other. So somebody asks you rhetorically, how do you know there is no other God? How, how would you answer that question? How would, how would you do it? Where, where, would, where would your testimony come from? Yeah, that's, 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 it could be a trick question. It could be a trick me question if you hadn't thought about it. How do you know God is good? How do you know there's no other God? How do you know what truth is? Who's to say that's the only truth? Right? Whew. That's why we rehearse this. Because <laughs> if you are living that testimony life, that's what's going to happen. God's going to send people to you who's going to want to know that answer. Yeah, something just popped. Is green light on? The green light is on. We're all going to take a commercial break. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Richard. Yes, sir. Uh, oh, you mean there's been technical difficulty? Yes, sir. There has been um, throughout my whole sermon. But, you know, I'm not deterred. We're going to keep going. Okay. Yeah. Hold on one second, guys. Yeah, that's what Testing, one, two, testing. Sometimes I think when this stuff happens, Satan doesn't want, don't want you to keep yeah. going. That, that honestly, I really do. That's um, true. That, that, that just, he just gets in the way. So maybe what I'm saying is good stuff. And he's like, nope. But we just talked about God's promises. We just talked about it, right? So I'm asking you, how do you know God's promises are true? How do you know his promises to you are yes? And what would you say to someone who, ask you how do you know those questions right, what's your testimony in that right and I'm just going to encourage you right? I'm not going to give you an answer right here right but this is why we rehearse this in church this is why we fellowship with one another this is why we get out there because this the whole world needs to know who he is right this is all Satan's on his job we know that he's on his job now <laughs> right but yeah maybe you are the answer that that someone has been waiting for for years in your family. And for some reason you haven't gotten up, walked over and said something. Have you, have you thought about that a little bit? Have you thought about that temple of God's Holy Spirit uh, as being part of God's body? Maybe, maybe that's what that is. Maybe we just haven't had an opportunity to, to, um, to do that. Now I can't, I don't know if they can hear me on, um, on Zoom or not, but I'll talk loud and we're just going to keep going. We keep rolling. I'll let you guys do your thing. Okay. So Matthew 28, you guys know this scripture. Matthew 28 verses 16 through 20. Matthew 28 verses 16 through 20. I'm going to read that to you. Because again, we rehearse this every single week. This is Jesus' last words to his disciples. And he left that record for us. Verse 16, the 11 disciples traveled to Galilee to the mountain where Jesus had directed them. Verse 17, when they saw him, they worshiped, but some doubted. I, I, I'm, I'm stunned when I read that, right? But that's just a human being. I'm stunned because I'm here and I'm reading it as a historical fact. But if I had been there or had you been there, would you have doubted too? With all the stuff that just, just happened, all of a sudden Jesus is still talking. Jesus still meet me up in the mountain. Jesus is still meeting me and instructing me and teaching me and loving me. Some doubt it. Jesus came near. There we go. Looks like we're alive again. All right. Jesus came near, it says, in verse, uh, I'll read verse 17 again. When they saw him, they worshiped, but some doubt it. Verse 18, Jesus came near and said to them, so Jesus again goes near. Right? He didn't say, come here, disciples. Jesus went near. So that's, that's it. With God moving towards us, God's always making a move towards us. Right? He's always coming near. Right? That, that, should, that should give us some 
some comfort in that sense, right? He's coming to us. It's Jesus' thoughts, it's the Holy Spirit's thoughts, it's the Father's thoughts about us that matter. Not what we think about him necessarily. It goes first. What does he think about you? <laughs> what does he think about you? Right? And he's always making the move towards us. And he says to them, all authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. All authority. So what authority can you think of that's greater or falls outside of that? But he says all authority. All authority. That's even authority over death. That's authority over relationships. That's authority over politics. That's, a, that's authority over uh, whatever you want to think about, right? Whatever the issues are of the day, that's the authority that he has. Don't get caught up thinking that it's not the case. Because Jesus is always on the case. All authority has been given to him in heaven and earth. Go, he says. Church, he tells us to go, therefore, this is his mission, and make disciples of all nations. There it is again. All nations. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you, and remember, I am with you always. I am with you always. So it may feel like you're alone, but you're not really alone. Jesus is with you always to the end of the age. To the end of the age, Jesus is always with us. So he sent us on our mission, just like, just like in the old covenant when we see the temple built, right? And the temple, part of the reason it was built was for the world to see who God is. Now we are imbued with the Holy Spirit living in us and among us. And now the whole world gets to see if we're doing what we've been called to do. The whole world gets to see who God is. If we're, if we're testifying, if, if, we're, if, if, we're, if, we're, if we're making it matter what we do and say, then the world begins to know who he is to you and how you love, how you talk. So as God's temples, we remember God's people, then, that's me and you, need his presence. We need his presence. Every generation can find reasons to plead with God to be present with them as he was with their ancestors. We, we can talk about another generation when people used to go to church more. We can, we can, we can reminisce all this other stuff that we think that God is always present. But in Christ, we never need to fear that he will abandon us or leave us because Jesus has said he will never do that. I just want to cut to you. We don't ever have to worry about that. I know sometimes we get caught up in our hearts and minds and think that we've done something so radical, so bad, that he can't possibly want to be around me. Right? Sometimes we think that. But never fear. He would never leave you nor forsake you. The ability to be devoted to God and to testify about him comes from God. Comes from God. The Lord's continued presence with us and his faithful work in us causes us to devote, causes us to be devoted to him. We need God to work in us so that he can work through us. We need God to work in us so that he can work through us. So again, we're talking about the mission of outgoing. And then finally, all people need to know the Lord is God. This has always been the mission of God and the mission he has given to his people, to me and you. This has always been the mission. And, and because I think it has always been, it gets... It, that mission gets fractured, it gets twisted. We think of, we start to think of, just for lack of a better word, evangelism. I, I'm going to say testifying. I'm going to be saying sharing your witness. That's what I want to say. But we, we, we get all kinds of thoughts attached to that. And it becomes one of the hardest things, one of the least favorite things we want to do as Christians. We want to leave that to somebody else, right? 
But I'm here to say, you, everybody sitting in these seats, everybody with an earshot of my voice, that's what we've been called to do, to testify of him. This has always been God's mission that he sent us on, to be conduits of God's blessings as they declare to the world around them the glory of God through their words and their deeds. The glory of God through your words and your deeds. So what you say matters. How you say what you say matters. What you do matters. And how you do what you do matters. And somebody doesn't like me speaking on this mic, right? But that's okay. Grab the other mic. Grab the other mic. Oh, okay, go on. Testing. So the battery did go off on this one eventually. So it does matter. It does matter, church. <laughs> I know we're laughing. I know we're having a good time. But let's let's have a good time. Remember what God is telling us to do. We can have a good time doing all of that, right? You know, be surrounded by, you know, RJ just turned 18. And RJ, you know, I know you guys probably read it last week. RJ put a thing on Facebook, on, uh, on Instagram. I'm going to embarrass him a little bit. But he was thanking God for 18 years. He was thanking God for the people he had in his life, right, surrounded by his life. And, and it just made me think, you know, if, you, if, if your thoughts are central to who God is, right, and if you're surrounded by people of God, people who want to lift you up, People who aren't going to let you forget that, right? My, my, my lovely wife, every time Marjorie goes to a track meet, and she's not going to be there. She's going to give him this same soliloquy. And he probably has it down by heart by now. But he's always going to remember who he's representing, right? And who he should be respectful to because of who he's representing, right? And that, that's it, right? That's that testimony of his mom, hopefully his dad too. Hopefully all of you in here, those who relate to him, testify to the goodness of who God is. So we should declare loudly today as we think about who we are, the temple, as we reflected on the temple in the Old Testament, that the Lord is God. There is no other. There is no other. The Lord is God. There is no other. So, a couple of questions before we end here. How will you respond to God's desire to dwell among his people? Better, better yet, it's rhetorical. I want you to think about it. How will you respond to God's desire, his desire to dwell in you? How, how are you responding to that? Yeah. To whom will you declare God's faithfulness this week? His faithfulness today, tomorrow, next month, to whom will you be declaring who God is? How will you tell them of his glory? How will you tell them about Christ? It's not if, but it's when and how are you going to respond to the good news of who Jesus is and who you are in him? And what you have because of him, right? And what you can do through him. What are you gonna, what's gonna be your response? Right? That's what we want to call you to do every Sunday. No, point you to Jesus. Even if we read the Old Testament, point you to Jesus and then ask you, what's your response to the truth? What is your response? Don't walk out of here and say, Oh, I got the good word today, and I'm feeling good. I hope you did get the good word. I do, but I hope you get the good word tomorrow, and I hope you get the good word Tuesday, and I hope you give a good testimony on Wednesday, and I hope you meet a neighbor on Thursday. I hope you, I hope you go spread some salt on Friday. I hope you fellowship with someone on Saturday, and I hope you do it again on Sunday, and then I hope you do it again next week, right? And I hope you open up the scripture. And I hope you find out who this Jesus Christ is, right? Who he is and what that means for you 
and how by the Spirit in Christ, <laughs> this, is, this is where our testimony flows from, that you can really be thankful that you are now called the temple of the Holy Spirit because you have gotten revelation, divine revelation of who God is. And now you can never be the same. You can never be the same. When you hear the truth, the truth, as it says in John 8, 32, shall set you free. So you are free. So what are you going to do with the freedom found in Christ? If you do these things, then you should know the truth. That's John 38, 31 says. And the truth shall set you free. So, and I hope you open up your word and you, you encounter Jesus Christ. Right? If you read John, like I've been reading John, he's just going to be pointing you to the Father. Christ going to be pointing to the Father the whole time. <laughs> That's what he's doing. Right? So you get the chance to meet the Father and all this. Because if you've seen Jesus, you've seen him. That's what he says. You know, if you want to know, if you want eternal life, that's what it says in John, then, come on now, you guys know this. If you don't, I want you to encounter him there. I want you, I want you to read through the scriptures so you know what I'm talking about. When you start reading those long, old chapters about the, the artistry of the temple. Why so painstaking? Well, what would you do for your God? What would you do for the one true God? Right? So I, I, that's, my, that's, my, that's my encouragement for you today, not to walk away with a story about the temple or a story about Solomon, but a story about Jesus and an action that you can take in Jesus for Jesus. Go you, therefore, into all the world. I get that. The song's going in my mind now. Old song. Preach the gospel unto everyone. Teach all nations to absorb all things. God is with me. I have commanded you, right? So it does matter what you think, what you say in Christ. It does. So be encouraged. All right. Be joyful of the call that you have in your life, that you are a temple, right? Be be so overfilled, right? That's the thing to be overflowing with all of this that you can't help but take your cup. Because it's spilling over and say, please bring your cup over here that's empty. Let me let some of this pour into that glass, into that cup. And you can drink, you can taste what I'm, I'm, we're tasting to see that the Lord is good. So let's do it together, right? And God has a way of making those divine appointments. He does. He does. He just don't even, I had one of those at the track meet. A two hour conversation with a man who just starts to just pour his heart out at the pool. At the pool, and he said, Hey, could we meet again? <laughs> can we meet up tomorrow? Can we get, bring our kids to the pool? We meet up tomorrow. I had never met this guy, and I had just read that that devotion that Pastor Tim had given me. And then all of a sudden, I had these like I talk, I called Vanita, them and my people in the hotel because I was gathering them all up, right? But it is wonderful when you're able to share like that and people receive it. Phew. Right? Wow. It's a good stuff. So this none of this is in my notes, guys. I'm rifting right here. This is big ball going out here. So let me not go too long here. So we can go ahead and get into communion. So uh, I want to close in prayer and then we're going to have uh, community serve and we'll be the nice thing to be together. So Father, you created the world to be your dwelling place with humanity. But our actions and our sins and our carelessness have alienated us from you. Thank you for making provision for our sin, for our absent-mindedness, for our thoughtlessness, for our laziness. Thank you for making provision in the true temple of your incarnate son, Jesus Christ. And for making us the church a temple in him in which the Holy Spirit dwells. Use our presence in this world, everyone who is here today, to point to you as the one true God. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. So we'll go ahead and take up, uh, we'll come to the table. I'm just going to take up another offering. <laughs> um, we'll come to the table. Maybe you got to want to give some. Listen, if you want to drop some in the basket, that's fine. Uh, but we're going to go ahead and uh, take up communion together. And I want you to think of Jesus Christ as we just prayed, the incarnate son, Jesus, 
the true temple in which we dwell by the Holy Spirit. 